Hello, everybody, and welcome to our lecture on Piaget, uh, Jean Piaget, a Swiss originally bio, a marine biologist, and um, who, who uh, later became a very important, uh, perhaps the premier theorist in uh, cognitive developmental psychology. Interestingly, Piaget uh, had a daughter, and um, as he watched his daughter, he was intrigued to see her. Um, trial and error learning processes and he began to pay attention and later um, did research on hundreds of children and came up with what is arguably the most comprehensive um, um, theory about how during childhood we learn um, how we develop this uh, amazing ability to take in representations of the world store them and then use them to make decisions in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, so I'm going to highlight um, um, today some of the uh, most important aspects of Piaget's theory. His theory um, again has stood the test of time after 40 or 50 years because he simply um, uh, made the observation that what cognition is, is simply the storing of kind of these uh, mental representations of the world at large, and not only storing of it, but organizing it in efficient ways to be able to access and then use the information. So in Piaget's theory, um, we are constantly beginning from our earliest days, and probably even before we're born, but uh, there's not much uh, going on in there, um, but um, what we're constantly doing is we're um, responding with a um, a cognitive view of the world, if you will, a mental structure of the world, and as we experience things, we are adapting that um, existing cognitive structure to take in new information. In a real way, what we do is um, our by virtue of experiencing the world, we're slowly constructing our own cognitive um, structure, if you will, uh, so that um, we become cognitively the people that we um, create by virtue of not only our experience, but how we interact with our experience, process it, store it, and then later on use it. So Piaget's perspective is that we are these interactive, almost um, um, creative agents of our own minds. It's not that we just um, walk around and uh, the, our experiences kind of pour into our head. No, we are an active processor of um, the world, and uh, that processing is going to affect um, our cognitive view of the world and uh, therefore the way we think, feel, emote, behave, uh, it's kind of a cool uh, way to th uh, see things. Piaget said that, um, uh, well, this whole theory is based on this idea of schemes. And um, so you take several schemes and they um, develop a schema, and several schema um, uh, put them together and they develop uh, kind of this larger schema. But um, what a schema is, is just kind of like a not quite a photograph, but if you think about, uh, uh, I'm sitting here at my dining room table recording this, uh, um, and as I look at the lamp on the left of me, that lamp exists in the world, but my my um, cognitive um, representation of that lamp, I can't store the lamp in my mind, but um, the uh, image of it, uh, I guess if the lamp um, moved or talked or something like that, I, I pretty much take um, what's in my environment, the lamp, the table, uh, um, I, have a, I have a large um, carved wooden giraffe. Those things exist in the world, and uh, I can close my eyes as I talk, and um, I have the mental representation of these objects in my mind. And that's, that's what Piaget's um, theory of cognitive development is based upon, this idea that we, we kind of have these uh, files in our mind about... Uh, that represent things, objects, uh, experiences, and so on in our mind. 
And um, clearly as we grow developmentally, as our biology unfolds in terms of not only our body growing and allowing us to do different things, but the capacity and capability of our minds to uh, more accurately um, represent more and more complex things, you put those two things together and um, this allows us to have the amazing cognitive capacity all of us take for granted. So we have these schemes uh, that, uh, depending upon our unique experience, we develop. And Piaget said that there are two ways, um, not only that children, but you and I, even as adults, um, change our schemes. And they're the two A's, assimilation and accommodation. And you have to think of these um, two as really, in some ways, opposite sides of the same coin. So as you can see on the slide in front of you, assimilation is when we take in new information to our existing schemes or schemas. And accommodation is when we adjust a scheme to fit new information. So let me give you some examples here. Years ago, I was working at an orphanage down in the Virgin Islands. And um, uh, the way this orphanage was organized was into what they called cottages. And uh, so we took the kids from our cottage um, to the beach one day. And we were driving um, to a, a kind of remote beach. And we went through a small village. And one of the little kids, uh, uh, I think his name is Freddie, and he was about three, three and a half years old, he saw a goat um, from the van that I was driving, and he pointed at the goat and he said, look at that weird looking dog. And of course the older kids um, helpfully told him he was an idiot, and it wasn't a dog, it was a goat. Now this is a great example. Um, so think about Freddie. He had never experienced a goat before. He, he perhaps experienced dogs and cats and cows. That was his existing schema of animals. And he sees a goat. Um, what he tried to do was to accommodate. In other words, um, say that the goat was a weird looking dog. Uh, what he eventually had to do was assimilate, which is he had to create a new, um, a new category of animal in his schema of animals. In addition to the cow, um, cat and dog one, he add to add goat. So that's assimilation is when we, we, we um, add a new category. Accommodation would be if I have a category of dog, and uh, most of us have seen all kinds of different dogs, but um, so let's say I had seen German Shepherds and Golden Retrievers and Chihuahuas, and then one day I see, uh, I don't know, a, a miniature Schnauzer. Well, I haven't seen that before, but um, the miniature schnauzer um, is a dog. And so what I do is I adjust my scheme of dog now to um, account for this different looking dog than the ones I've experienced. So we're constantly, according to Piaget, assimilating and accommodating, um, adding categories, adjusting categories. Um, and this is how we slowly uh, and sometimes very rapidly build up um, the schemes in our mind uh, about the world by assimilating and accommodating um, hundreds and sometimes thousands of different times. This is what we're doing constantly and continuing, continually all the time. Piaget said that um, our biological development, which affects our brain, um, constrains us as we assimilate and accommodate uh, the world as we adapt and build these schemes. And so he laid out um, four large stages. Uh, the sensory motor, which is birth to two, pre-operational, two to about seven, concrete operational, which is seven to 11 or 12, and then the formal, which is really the early teenage years into uh, adulthood. And um, these four stages, uh, Piaget said, um, really involve um, different things. Now, what you see with all of these stages is that word operation, and um, particularly in the last three. Operations um, are what Piaget si simply says are what we do when we accommodate and assimilate. When we build schemas, uh, we're, we're operating, um, adapting to our environment. Uh, the first stage, though, the sensory motor, is, um, as its name would imply, um, 
that our schemes are based upon sensory information coming in. If you've ever spent much time with an infant, you know you hand them something and they'll grab it and put it right in their mouth. Um, and uh, if you think about it, the mouth uh, lips give you a feeling of how it, it um, feels. Um, you're, uh, you can see how it tastes. It's right by your nose. So you can smell it. You can, uh, so it's sens sensory information. And then we can move around. We can throw things. We can you know, uh, try and touch the mobile in front of us. We can uh, um, uh, engage in limited movements. So our schemas in the first two years of life, according to Piaget, are pretty much based upon sensory and motor information. Then once we go to the second stage, the pre-operational, because most of us are able to crawl around now, we're able to move, and by seven we're able to think and do math, rudimentary math, and watch TV, and uh, do all kinds of things. Speech comes in. So our, our um, schema building is, is what uh, Piaget called pre-operational, in that um, our operations are very, very much stuck in um, um, the what we can do, what we can see. Uh, we're limited in being able to perceive the world accurately. We're still focused upon uh, the sensory and motor input, but we can do this a little more complicated. Concrete operational stage um, is called concrete because clearly between 7 and 11 years of age, we, are, we can get do way, way more than we can do in the two earlier stages, but our ability to uh, accommodate and simulate are still based upon the actual world and um, what actually we see, taste, um, feel in front of us. Um, so our, our schemes are still relatively concrete. And it's not to this last stage, which Piaget called the formal, that we really, in some ways, are liberated from the actual world. Now we can engage in um, imagination. Uh, we can engage in abstract thinking. We can, we can even think things that don't even exist we can um, uh, do things like uh, advanced uh, math. Uh, we can we can uh, try and understand um, um, philosophy. We all of us understand um, and can imagine what a unicorn is, even though a unicorn isn't an actual concrete uh, being. Um, our imagination, our ability to engage in idealistic and um, abstract logical thinking. Um, really allows our brains uh, to take off in uh, ways in which up to um, the end of uh, the school years were kind of impossible. Now let's go back. Sensory motor stage, as I mentioned before, um, is based upon sensation and perception. Really, we have these patterns of behaving that are often repetitive, which give us information. So you may have uh, noticed uh, if you're around a baby that they tend to to do things over and over again. Even their speech is what we call echolalic. They'll go la, 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 la. It's almost like they're saying it and listening. Um, they'll, they'll hit something uh, a number of times. Um, and all of this isn't just random, um, you know, pointless activity, no. Um, these uh, abilities to do things and to experience the sensory information that comes in is building our schemes, telling us information about the world we live in so that we can rely on them. Uh, that really is um, the essence of the sensory motor stage. Piaget divides the sensory motor stage up into six substages. I'm not going to go through them all, um, but you can see and read these uh, clearly. Uh, and, and his ages are relatively um, flexible. But you can see it goes from, from very simple reflexes in our first month uh, of life to what he called these pri the second one, the primary circular reactions, these kind of attempts to coordinate um, stuff I do with then the, the consequences, the results. How does it sound? How does it feel? Uh, to um, the third stage, four to eight months, the secondary circular reactions where I become a little more intentional and um, about my uh, um, manipulation of objects in the world and um, I'm going to do things that seem more interesting to me and if something doesn't seem interesting to me so they're secondary. Then stage four is coordinating of these, putting these together in sequences. Uh, stage number five is tertiary which is a Latin word tertius meaning third, three. 
So um, I, I'm putting these together in terms of um, my interest of, um, hey, that's new. Uh, or I wonder what would happen if I, you know, um, stuck my finger in, in, you know, the dog's ear or something like that. In other words, it becomes um, increasingly more complicated in that um, 12 to 18 month range. And finally, this last stage of the sensory motor stage of development is this, um, I begin internalizing these schemes. In other words, I'm just, it's not that I just do it, but now I have an internal, can I say, representation mental representation of my schemes so that um, if I'm sitting in a uh, crib and I've, I, I'm laying there and I remember that, wow, there's a mobile and I remember the last time that I hit that, it made interesting sounds and made interesting noises and uh, it changed, it rotated. So I've internalized that so now I can remember that and um, reinitiate the action um, in an interesting kind of way. Moving on to the pre-operational stage, um, I'm not doing full operations yet. Um, in other words, I haven't internalized the world, but I'm sophisticated enough that I um, begin to be able to, in a way more sophisticated way than my first two years of life, um, act and um, act on the, my world and uh, watch what happens and learn from it and uh, continue to represent those in more and more complicated ways. Um, uh, of course, which interact with my memory of what, what I liked and what I didn't like and how interesting things were, how boring things were. Um, kids in this stage are fascinated with uh, questions. If you're around children this age, you know they're always, always asking, what, you know, why is the sky blue? Why do clouds move? You know, uh, so on and so forth. So it's not quite um, operational. Uh, but it certainly is the beginning of, and laying the foundation of my later ability to be pretty complicated in my operations. One of the things that um, uh, clearly happens from two to seven is um, language, and language is the ultimate cognitive representation. Uh, because if you think about it, in order to grasp language, we have to grasp the idea of um, symbolic thinking that this letter that I'm looking at, this, this squiggle on a page, represents a sound I can make. And when I put those letters together in consistent ways, they make words. And those words, although they're squiggles on a piece of paper and they're sounds we make, represent actual uh, objects and experiences in my environment. Language is the kind of mo probably the most amazing thing that we do as human beings we take it for granted but these the this this kind of stable um, um, image or sim symbolic um, system that um, we latch onto uh, explodes the possibilities for us to store and represent the world Words mean something, and not only the words, but then we can put words in combinations which subtly affect how those words um, come to represent themselves in my mind. So the dog sat, the dog ran, the dog threw up, the dog ate the cat. We're using the word dog, but um, just saying that sentence in our minds all brings up very, very different representations from throwing up to sitting to eating a cat. Um, and um, so pre-operational um, uh, stage is huge because of language. Uh, and Piaget divided up into two sub-stages, symbolic function, again, the, the appropriation of words, and then the intuitive thought stage, which is now beginning to use those words and put them together to intuit um, how the world works and how the world responds. The third stage is concrete operational stage. We're doing operations now, but they're still pretty much based upon um, the real concrete world that I observe. Um, certainly children this age can imagine, but even when they imagine, they imagine actual things. Uh, their imagination um, doesn't go be, um, to things that don't actually exist. And you could, you could uh, understand why 7 to 11-year-olds would find certain kinds of math, 
certain kinds of physics, uh, certain kinds of philosophy, theology, religion, um, certain creative um, uh, expressions of art to be somewhat, what? You know, somewhat uh, um, nonsensical. Um, so, but in order for us to get to that stage where we can, if you will, almost be freed from the real world to imagine and engage in, in uh, hypothetical thinking, we have to, to master, and this is what the concrete operational stage is, uh, the actual world um, and understand all the properties um, that take place in the actual world. Um, and once we master those, then we're at the threshold of being able to go on in formal operational stage. So um, there are a bunch of tasks here. Conservation is simply the ability um, for us to um, uh, understand that uh, things stay the same even though they look different. Uh, so for instance, um, if you looked at the three examples uh, that we have here in front of us, conservation of number, matter, and length. So confirmation of number, um, we, we have to realize that, that um, if we had these eight, um, say, uh, pennies that were placed close together and um, um, in two rows, those rows obviously look even. But if we space them apart, early um, pre-operational, the child would say that there are more pennies in the top row because they tend to focus on how it looks. Look, it looks longer instead of the absolute number. Um, so conservation of number would simply be that the number is different than how the objects necessarily look in terms of the size they take up. Uh, I remember as a kid being a little confused when I came to the United States uh, um, and because uh, American money confused me. Where I grew up in Ethiopia, the pennies were the smallest coin and the nickels were a little bigger, dimes were even bigger, quarters were bigger, there was a 50 cent piece and there was a dollar piece. In other words, the coins got bigger as they got more valuable. And I was quite confused when I first got here as a little kid. Um, my parents visited because the, I, I couldn't figure out why would the penny be bigger than the dime? That makes no sense. Um, and again, that's part of learning that value is not necessarily in size. Um, value um, is independent of size sometimes. Uh, so we've all heard that, um, you know, little children like big gifts, but um, big gifts are usually probably cheaper than small gifts. Diamonds cost a lot uh, more, you know, than a box filled with uh, tissues. And yet most kids would uh, be, before they opened up the uh, present, would be pretty excited about a big box that was wrapped up rather than the small one. So um, conservation of matter, again, if you took two balls of clay, um, and um, showed uh, equal balls of clay and showed them to children um, in their shape if they looked the same and then um, asked the children if they were the same amount and then squashed one in front of them. Early on in the pre-operational stage or in concrete operational stage, children would um, say, no, 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 the one on the left um, is, um, bigger, is more than the one on the right. Why? Because they're focusing upon how it looks and they're ignoring the actual mass or matter. Um, so conservation um, tasks are simply that we have to learn that how things look or appear doesn't necessarily equal with how things actually are. Uh, some other um, uh, uh, tasks that have to be mastered in the concrete operational stage, uh, one is seriation or putting things in order. Um, you know, putting things um, from... Uh, smallest to biggest is relatively easy, but there's all kinds of orders um, um, that we uh, uh, have to learn. Smallest to biggest is easiest, maybe um, whitest to blackest, um, if we had a bunch of uh, you know white, black, and gray objects. Those are relatively easy, but then we have to learn to seriate, for instance, things like what are the value of these things in front of you? Um, uh, if you looked at these objects in front of you, which would last the longest? Seriation is something that we take for granted, but we're constantly internally, according to Piaget, um, ordering our world um, in terms of, you know, uh, if you said the movies I like, the ten, top 10 movies, well, you have to put them in some serial order. What's number one? What's number two? What's number three? And so on and so forth. 
Another classification skill we learn is transitivity. Um, uh, this is simply our ability to um, uh, classify things uh, according to more than one category. So the world is very, very complicated. It'd be nice if we just um, had one category. But if you've ever had to choose between, you know, say going to three different colleges, well, there are um, 50 different variables you have to consider in these three different colleges, and that's why it gets complicated. Or you have two people you could possibly, you know, date, uh, or three people, or five people, or, you know, 600 people if you're on, you know, um, match.com or something like that. Well, what among all of the character traits that you're looking for or values that you're looking for, how to seriate those in a way that allows you to kind of come up with some kind of uh, process of discerning, you know, what's more important and how do I translate this into that? Uh, pretty important. And kids are mastering this. Uh, very important in mastery is the ability to uh, engage in organizational and higher, whether it's it's hierarchical organization. So, for instance, um, you and I take this for granted, but um, uh, coming up with categories of larger um, to smaller is pretty important. So, if we said, for instance, that A, um, um, I know that there are little p uh, pictures of people here, but A would be um, edible things, and then uh, B would be fruit, C would be vegetables, D would be meat. And of course, if we went back to B um, as fruit, well, there's not just two kinds of fruit, but um, we'd have to learn there's oranges, apples, um, mangoes, uh, papayas, guavas, and so on. And even if we went to the kinds of apples, well, um, every time I go to the store, I'm always confused. There's red ones, there's green ones, there's yellow ones, um, so we could organize them by color, but they all have a name. There's gala, there's red, uh, delicious, there's, uh, uh, I can't remember the other ones. But um, um, So putting things in some order um, is also a classification skill that becomes very, very important. Finally, we get to the formal operational stage, which um, appears between uh, 11 and 15, but for many of us continues on into adulthood. Uh, some of us continue to um, learn and grow and challenge ourselves with um, uh, understanding new things, but basically what formal operations is all about is being able to use your mind um, in a way which is somewhat uh, freed from the actual concrete um, you know, real world, if I could put real in quotes. So we can think abstractly. Um, so, you know, A equals B plus C. Well, that makes no sense um, in a concrete manner. How could A equals B plus C? But um, when we see that A represents something and B and uh, C represent two other things and that the combination of B and C would in some way or some, in some quality equal A, um, uh, that abstraction... Um, the ability to think logically, even when that logical progression of thought um, doesn't have any actual ex you know, experience in life. So, for instance, if I said to you, well, why, why does inflation um, tend to go up uh, when the economy improves? Well, whoa, uh, a little kid would say, well, I don't know, and I don't know if I'm getting this right, but we'd have to follow some logical progression that would go so... When the economy improves, uh, that means that companies need to produce more because people are buying more. And so in order to produce more, they need to hire more people. And because there are a limited amount of people out there, in order to hire more people, they have to pay more money. So people are making more. But they also have to charge more money if they're paying people more, so they raise their prices. And people are making more so they can afford those prices which means that um, inflation tends to go up. Now, I don't know if there are gaps in my logic there, but again, a seven or nine-year-old is not going to be under, able to understand that, and some of us, is, is, even as adults, it seems a little bit, um, um, you know, we, we go, oh, uh, I don't know if I really understand that. So, But that would be kind of a logical um, um, thinking process that's necessary in formal operational. Um, 
the 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 um, not only abstract and logical thinking, but certainly idealistic kind of thinking, we we gain the capacity not only to see things as they are, but but think of what idealism is. It's um, okay. This is what I observe here, but you know if we could do this and we could do that and we could you know uh, change this and we could change that, um, we could make you know this particular situation that we're observing better for the following reasons. Idealism, in some ways, is um, particularly idealism that does, that is not just ridiculous, but um, is based in in app and um, the ability to do it. Uh, I listened to a podcast the other day about um, uh, uh, a bunch of teenagers. Uh, they were kind of nerds, but they went on some class trip. Um, somewhere in the third world, and they observed that there was, I think they went to Costa Rica, and um, they observed the beauty of the place, but they observed that there was so many styrofoam, so much styrofoam garbage around. So they, they, they come back from their school trip, and they decide that they're going to come up with a way to recycle styrofoam. Now, uh, they were told by you know their science teacher, and they you know they went on the internet that uh, this just isn't possible. Well, what's cool about <laughs> about being 14, 15, and 16 is just isn't possible. Sometimes is not something you really well you know you understand. And so they they tried a million different things, uh, not a million, but they kept trying and failing, trying and failing, trying. They kept. Um, they uh, interviewed a lot of uh, science, and they, they kept being told, no, this can't be done, this can't be done. Well, you got to hand these, uh, I think there were three friends. Um, it took them three or four years, but believe it or not, they've actually come up with a way to somehow take styrofoam and recycle it um, in a way, A, to make the, um, uh, the material useful, and B, to change the chemical, and I don't understand this at all, you know. To change its chemical composition by adding something to it, to make it far more likely um, to disintegrate far more quickly. Now that's idealism. You see a problem, and say, "Hey, we could work on this," and um, and even though they were told that uh, logically it can't be done, obviously they were wrong. Um, the world is full of people that said logically, you know, the Earth is flat, or logically, you know, the Earth is the center of the universe, and uh, that's the nature of scientific discovery is this idealism um, that adolescents often have. Hypothetical deductive thinking is also something that comes in the formal operational stage. And um, this is, again, uh, coming up with a hypothesis and then not actually going and doing it, but using your brain um, to deduce what the likely outcome is if A happens, if B happens, if C happens. Now, you and I take this for granted because we're always doing this. You know, if I take this job, you know, um, what's going to happen? Or if I don't do that, um, again, uh, you try this with seven and eight-year-olds. Say, if this happened, you know, what do you think would be the result? And their, their answers tend to be very either experience-based or very, very obviously concrete-based. As we get into our adolescent years, we're able to be way more creative and, quite frankly, way more accurate because we have more information of the world and our brain isn't limited to the concrete here and now in coming up um, with a way um, to uh, express our thoughts.